Hey Church, in light of current events in our nation and decisions of our government, Pastor Dave has elected to pause our current sermon series. You asked for it. Today we'll have a heart to heart about the momentous times we're living in and how they line up with God's Word. Good morning Church, glad to see all of you here this morning. I have uh, uh, issued an all call for LifeLink and I'm so glad to see that you came this morning. I want to... Um, tell you I'm grateful that you have chosen to make this weekend a priority in worship. I'd like to um, spend a little bit of time and really process with our church family what really happened on Friday when the U.S. Supreme Court legalized uh, the homosexual marriage concept uh, across all 50 states. I want to put this in a biblical context for where we're at and I want us to know as the people of God how to respond to this and how to live in light of this. So as we're going through this this morning, what I want to remind you before we get to where we're really going to dig into this morning, that uh, on, f on Friday, the Supreme Court handed down what I believe will be the Roe versus Wade concept in our generation. Uh, for those of you that are familiar, back in the um, middle part of the last century, our, our U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion. And uh, it, become a, it became a huge travesty for our nation I believe this one is uh, what has just happened. This is functionally going to be the Roe v. Wade uh, of, of what our generation is going to work, uh, work through as they redefine what marriage is in all 50 states. So there is now some level of, you know, what do we do in light of this? Because uh, they're specifically going straight against the Word of God in these things, and it's going to call for some type of uh, response in our own life, at least de defining how are we going to think about this, how will we process this, and how do we live? Well, first of all, let me just say that the church should not panic. All right? The Supreme Court can do many things in our nation, but they cannot put Jesus Christ back in the grave. <laughs> Jesus Christ of Nazareth is still alive. He has overcome the world and he is moving throughout his divine plan and purpose to call the universe towards his kingdom. And I believe today we're living in history. We want to know exactly what time it is so that we can live how he wants us to live and be light in a dark world and salt in a nation that desperately needs transformation. So let's open our heart to the Lord in prayer and let's ask God to guide us in our understanding so that we will know how to live the life he's called us to live. Let's join in prayer. Heavenly Father, today we come before you and ask that you would open our understanding. God, we know that you are powerful and we thank you for the grip of your word, the grip of your grace on our lives. We, your people, uh, uh, intend, God, to align ourselves with you, your word, and live in unity and live in the conviction of faith according to your word and by your power and spirit. Thank you for all you'll do in us today in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So what I want to do today is start by clearly identifying two layers of what's really happening uh, in, this, in the times that we live. So if you have your notes, I'm going to ask you to make sure you get those out. Follow along. Most of what we're going to be working through today is scripture. I do have some fill-ins towards the end of the journey. But as we go into this, what I want you to realize is the surface issue that was spotlighted by the Supreme Court and uh, the eyes of our nation this weekend was homosexual marriage. All right, if the, those of you that weren't watching the news or whatever on Friday, that's what happened. So the surface issue is homosexual marriage. But what I also want to point out is that that's just the surface issue. That isn't the real issue. So I want to pause for a moment and identify what's really at stake here. What's really going on isn't uh, the, the U.S. Supreme Court's definition of marriage legalizing homosexual marriage. That's, not, that's the surface issue, but what's really happening is there's a different objective going on. Satan's real objective is much bigger than that. What's really happening is his direct assault on the Word of God to completely dismantle the authority of God's Word in our nation. So while right now the issue at hand is homosexual marriage... The issue beyond that, that's really where all this is going, is does God's word have authority in the earth? So I want us to make sure we don't get swept up in just the surface issue. 
Because the surface issue will elicit a lot of opinions. And you may get swept into lots of debates if you just simply deal with the surface issue and, and, and respond when people ask you, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about homosexual marriage? What do you think about these things? If you answer just at the surface level, you're going to be swept into debates that you cannot, that you cannot untangle easily. Instead, what we need to be focused on is what's the real issue? The real issue is does God's word have authority in this earth and am I living under the authority of the word of God and the lordship of Christ? So three weeks ago, I preached a sermon on the end times and what I'd like to do is reconnect now uh, with, with that sermon and then uh, connect that with the attack on God's word that we're seeing this weekend. And let's let the Holy Spirit bring some things into, into focus for us. Jesus in the books that we're going to look at today in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians are going to provide for us a panoramic view of what the world will look like at the return of Christ. So what I'm going to do now is actually start with Scripture and let the Holy Spirit begin to bring into focus where I believe we are in time. And let's let the Holy Spirit guide us forward. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-4, through 4, New King James says, now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ has come. So the Second Thessalonians was actually written a few weeks after First Thessalonians was, was written and sent because there was a rumor going around in Thessalonica that the return of Christ had already happened. So the Apostle Paul is saying, now listen, hold on, don't get shaken here. Let me bring some clarity to what's going on. It hasn't happened yet. That's what this part of the scripture was saying. Then he says, let no man see, deceive you by any means, for that day, capital D, which means the day of the returning of Christ, will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So the apostle Paul is basically saying, don't worry, the return of Christ hasn't come yet, and it won't happen until there is a worldwide falling away from truth. In other words, a, bib, a, re, a complete rejection of biblical authority and the morality that goes in the guidance of God's word. And so he's saying that won't happen until we see this great falling away. And I propose today to you that is exactly what we're seeing. Now I'm going to measure that in two different ways. I'd like to take a look now at what's happening in the world we live in. The falling away of the world uh, from the truth. But I also want to highlight some things that's going on in the church because there are great portions of the church that's actually falling away from the word of truth as well. So let's talk about the world that we grew up in. In the world that I grew up in, every classroom had the Ten Commandments on display. Some of you may remember that. In the world my parents grew up in, every day at school they started with prayer in Jesus' name. Some of you are nodding your heads. You remember that, that day. It just... You just, there was a general collective assumption that our neighbors were Christians, the teachers were Christians, our culture was Christian. There was this general awareness that we as a nation were really under God, the authority of God's word, and followed Christ as Christians. But then there were some things that happened. In 1962, the Supreme Court banned prayer in public schools. In 1980, the open display of the Ten Commandments was banned in public schools. Some, how many of you guys remember when those two big things happened? All right. So they happened, and what we're seeing now is over the past 50 years, there has been a pronounced movement in our culture away from the Word of God. In the past couple of three years, it has, it has ha happened at an astoundingly accelerated rate. In other words, what began as slow, deliberate things has all of a sudden begun to be a tsunami of movement of our culture away from the Word of God and against the Bible. The Bible calls this an apostasy, which means the renunciation of faith. Our culture has renounced its faith in the Bible. And what took place on Friday morning with the Supreme Court legalizing homosexual marriage is an open, flagrant attack on the Bible. 
okay? Right now, we have a wholesale rejection of biblical morality in the society we live in. We live right now in a post-Christian, post-Bible world. Okay? Unfortunately, it's not just in the world, it's in the church. Jesus prophesied that when he returns, half the church would be false. His disciples asked him in Matthew chapter 24 when his return would be and then what would be the signs of his return. He told them not to let anyone deceive them. And then he gave them a graphic description of the world at the end, what it would look like and how they would understand the season of his coming. Then in Matthew 25, he gave three parables about his return and how to prepare for his return. What I'm going to do now is take a look at one of the parables Jesus gave in Matthew 25. And this is where he prophesied that half of the church would be false. All right, and the reason we're talking about this, you guys, is so that we live our lives with our eyes wide open. The issue is not, are we defeated? We are not. We, are, we belong to the king. We belong to the kingdom of God. He always wins. We just can't be deceived, yes or no. So let's take a look at this. Here in Matthew chapter twi- uh, 25, from the NIV, verse 1, it says, At the time, Jesus is saying, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. All right, so here we have in in this picture, Jesus is the bridegroom. The ten virgins represent the church. Half of the, all of them had the lamps, what was symbolizing the form of actually being prepared for the bridegroom, the return of the bridegroom, which in, in our cases, our understanding is the return of Christ. But half of them had the oil, which meant they are actually ready for that. They had the lamp, the form, and the power, which was the oil, to make the lamp work. Does that make sense, everybody? What's interesting here is that all of them became drowsy and fell asleep. Now, this is not necessarily the judgment. The idea is that it is possible that we all, whether we're we're legitimately following Christ or whether we're only pretending to follow Christ, all of us have the propensity to be lulled into kind of this, this dullness, if you will, of what's really going on. But the good news is... Verse 6, at midnight, a cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come to meet him. In other words, there was something that happened that snapped everyone into attention and said, hey guys, it's time. Everyone woke up. Does that make sense? Then all the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for, uh, for both of us. Instead, you go to those who sell oil, buy some from yourselves. But, verse 10, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the, the door was shut. Verse 11, later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day nor the hour. What's interesting here is Jesus didn't say that you won't know the season or the times. He said you won't know the exact day nor the, nor the exact hour. Does that make sense? So in this story here, as we're watching this unfold again, Jesus the bridegroom, the, uh, the virgins, the ten virgins are the church in the world. He illustrates with this story that half of the church will be ready and half of the church will not. He also is illustrating here that the ones who are not ready are actually presenting themselves as if they are the church, but they're only pretending because they do not, they're not fully in relationship with him. They just have the form of it. And this is happening right before our very eyes, right now in the church. I want to read to you a couple of things that may actually astound you because many churches and denominations are rejecting the clear teachings of the Bible. 
Many churches are pro-abortion and give money to abortion-providing groups. A growing number of churches and denominations are ordaining, practicing homosexuals, and are pro-homosexual marriage. And this is dividing the church right down the middle. Breathe, everybody. It's okay. We're just opening our eyes to look at what's really going on so that we are alert and aware and can be responsive to the Holy Spirit guiding us forward in the lives that we live under the grip of the grace of Jesus Christ who saved us by what he did on the cross. We want to be awake, yes or no? So we need, to, we need to not pretend it's not happening. We need to acknowledge that this is happening. I recently heard Pastor Jimmy Evans tell a story of one of his board members who serves as a leader on a, in a major denomination that just attended a couple of months ago a denominational leaders conference. And one of the main leaders of that denomination got up and made this quote. I will not define my lifestyle or my sexuality by the four corners of this book. It is time for another testament to be written that is more up to date and is written for the times we're living in. When he said that, it was met by thunderous applause as the leaders agreed with him widely. Half of the, church do, half of the churches do not believe in a literal hell or a literal devil. That Jesus taught more about hell and the devil than he did about heaven. Many churches and denominations do not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And please hear me, everybody. This book is the Word of God. It is absolutely infallible. It is the Holy Word of God inspired by Him for our guidance. It is not for sale. Many churches today believe in universalism, which means Jesus is not the only way to heaven. Other, other religions can get you there if you're a good person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's simply not true. Please understand, though, m much of the church actually is true. They are true Christians who are ready for his return. I mean, when I look at the faces of many of you, I realize that this, this probably isn't half of us. I'm saying in the nation we live in, half of the churches and denominations are openly uh, teaching against clear teachings of the Scripture. That's important when you consider what the Apostle Paul was saying to the believers in Thessalonica. He said, Jesus hasn't returned, and he won't until there's a great apostasy, a great falling away. And Jesus then, he prophesied as well, when I return, half of the church will be false, and I will not know them. They'll only pretend to know me. And we're watching it happen right now. And to be clear, I don't know exactly when Jesus is going to return. What I do know is this. When I look at Jesus' description of what the world will look like when he returns, and when I look at the world we live in, it looks uncannily similar. It looks uncannily similar. In short, there is a pronounced falling away of the world and portions of the church from the truth of God's word from the truth of God's word. It's clear that's what's happening. So Jesus prophesies what the world will be like when he returns, and then he tells us how we should live in light of that. Look at Luke chapter 20, verses 34 through 36, New King James Version. It says, but take heed of yourself, which means take careful note, pay attention. Unless your hearts will be weighed down with carousing or revelry, drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day, or the return of Christ, will come upon you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. In other words, how many of you know what a snare is? It's a trap. You trap animals with it. They're kind of walking through the path of the woods. They don't see it. They step in it. And suddenly they didn't see it, but it snapped up on them and caught them. All right, so there's an unawareness element to this. And he says, watch out. Pay careful attention. Don't get caught up in what's going on in the world around you. But instead, verse 36, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. What's he saying? Pay attention. Do not fall in love with the world around us. Don't let it seduce you into its ways. 
because there is a great uh, prophetic event coming that we want to be ready for. And again, we don't know the day nor the hour, but we know the seasons and the signs of the times. And today we're living in an era that looks uncannily similar to what we see. Jesus says, this is what the world is going to look like when I return. So my job as I serve you as an apostolic leader in this house, as your pastor, is to say, open your eyes, pay careful attention how you're living, do not fall in love with the world around you. Why? Because if you fall in love with the world around you and live according to the ways of its values, you will reject the word of God. Your heart will be looking at the world instead of the word. There are, there are historic pictures of this in the Old Testament. One of them was when Lot and his family was taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels came to get them. They rescued and basically said, the judgment can't come till we take you out of the city. But as we go, do not turn around and look back. And as the angels drugged them out of the city, one of the things that happened is Lot's, Lot's wife actually turned to look back and the Bible said she was turned into a pillar of salt. The picture here is not just don't look over your shoulder. It was, a, it was a picture of saying don't love the world. Don't live according to its ways. Don't be drawn into the world around you. Instead, keep your eyes forward and follow the word of God. Does that make sense, everybody? The love of the world and rejection of God's word is another reflection of what we see happening on a large scale all around us. Look at 2 Thessalonians verse, uh, tw uh, chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. The NIV says this. The coming of the lawless one, which is another word for another definition or the, a title for the Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are, what's the word? Perishing. Perishing. Now watch this. They perish because, circle that, circle that word, because. They, they perish because they refuse to love, what? The truth, God's word, the truth. They are perishing because they refuse to love God's truth. And so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so they'll believe the lie. And so they'll be condemned who have not believed the truth but have already delighted in wickedness. Delighted in wickedness. So he's saying that there are people who make the conscious decision, I'm going to refuse to love the truth and instead believe the lie in the culture around us. I'm going to go that direction. I'm, and that's a choice, everybody. Once you make that choice, then you're under deception and there's a delusion that goes with that that actually kind of sets you on a path that's difficult, if not impossible, to overcome. But it starts with a choice that every individual makes. Which God will you serve? Will it be the God of the Bible, who is his word, or will it be the God little g of the universe we, or the world we live in, which is Satan and darkness and the, and the ways of his world? We make that choice. And this is where the message actually comes full circle. Those in powerful positions of influence in our nation's leadership have made an official decree on behalf of this nation that redefines marriage in a manner that is completely against God's word. In other words, officials representing our nation, they get into position because our nation votes them into position, which is a reflection of where the heart of our nation is. It's not simply a few people who make this. Those people are in those positions because our nation elected them. And you may say, well, I didn't, but the, cho the reality is you live in a world that more than half of the people in our nation actually elected the people that are leading our nation right now. Those people that they elected then put people in the Supreme Court that just made these decisions. Does that make sense? So what's happening in our nation is a reflection of the collective voice of our nation. Not necessarily you as an individual, but the collective voice of our nation as our leaders officially declared the Bible, God's word, will not be what defines our existence. 
we're going to write another testament. We're going to go another way. Remember, the surface issue is homosexual marriage. That's just the wrapper. The real issue is the authority of God's word. That's the real issue, the authority of God's word. And this section, this section of scripture we just read is describing exactly what's happening right now. The majority of our nation is refusing to love the truth, which is God's word, and is under strong deception from evil and is setting the world up to receive the lawless one. The lawless one, which is just one name for the Antichrist. Sometimes people ask me, hey, Pastor Dave, who do you think the Antichrist is? <laughs> well, unfortunately, there's just a lot of great... Uh, great you know people that would, you could qualify for it I, I mean there's just a lot of great names you can say this guy and that guy and that girl and that woman and I mean there's a there's a lot of great candidates for that that title I don't know who it is though what I do know is I believe we're all going to be gone before the end of Christ is revealed anyway because when I look back in the Old Testament both Noah and Lot who are prophetic, uh, historic, and you know, types and shadows, pictures of what's happening in the end times. Both of them escaped the, the devastation that came on the earth. And so I, th th my, my personal position, I'm a pre-trib guy. For those of you that study theology, I believe we're out of here before all this stuff happens. And I love that. Some of you are like, oh, what are you, an escapist? Well, kind of in a way. But I'm looking at it right when I see you. We're going to read this scripture in just a moment. That Jesus says, pray that you're qualified to escape the, the wrath that's coming. Some of you are like, well, I'm a spiritual marine. I'm saying, no, you're not. <laughs> you, you do not, I don't care how many guns you have, you do not want to be here when all that happens. What's a 45 compared to a comet? Right? Anyway, in a lot of the times we're living, the passage of Scripture we're about to read, this is of paramount importance. And I'm asking the question to you today, what is your relationship with the Bible? That's really the issue today. It isn't necessarily what's your opinion about homosexual marriage. That's just the surface issue. My question to you today is what is your relationship with the Bible, God's Word? That is really where your anchor has to hold. You've got to understand me. If you choose to simply focus on the surface issues and just render your opinions and rationalize with everybody else, you're going to be adrift on the chaos of confusion. What you really need to know is what's my relationship with the Bible. That's really the question. What do you mean, Pastor Dave, what's my relationship with the Bible? Well, let me give you a couple of words that might help you bring that into context. Are you aloof from the Bible as if it doesn't matter? Are you aware of the Bible? Like, um, I kind of know a little bit about it. Are you dating the Bible? Or are you married to it? Where, where does the Bible fit in your life? Do you live your life based on and under the authority of Scripture? Or is it just one of those other holy books? Why is that important? Because Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus is saying this. And please understand carefully. For whoever is ashamed of me and, what's the words? my words what is his words the Bible whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels and I'm saying that we are living today in a world that is absolutely attacking Jesus Christ his word and everything that's holy and sacred. The culture around us is exactly doing that. Please, everybody, understand Jesus said this is coming. This is not a shock to him. It isn't. By the way, it's also important to remember that Jesus actually chose to insert you into the unfolding flow of his kingdom and timeline right here. You weren't a cosmic accident that just arbitrarily showed you up right here. God planted you here for a reason. So that you could know Him in a powerful way. So that you who are uniquely equipped with understanding in the grip of the, of, of the revelation of the Word of God. Who walk closely with the Son of God and the power of the Holy Spirit can be a voice to people who are lost in darkness all around us. The hurting. The deceived. The discarded. The abandoned, all of them need us to show them God's grace and truth. But it will not, it will not be long before they realize that the constants that go with the choices of sin, no matter which one it is, 
is still consistent. And their people in our nation are ultimately going to suffer the consequences of that and they're going to need the church to be the church. People who understand the heartbeat of God, who know how to engage people with grace and truth. Everyone say grace and truth. Listen, we have to have our, our eyes wide open. We should be compassionate and loving to people. But folks, we cannot give away God's word. We cannot give his word up for anybody. Listen, Jesus was full of grace and truth. It, what I mean was it was 100% grace and 100% truth. When you think about this, let me give you a couple of word pictures. Truth without grace is like surgery without anesthesia. But grace without truth is anesthesia without corrective surgery. In other words, for you to be healed and whole, you need both. You need grace, but you also need truth. You also need truth. If you're only gracious and you're willing to just give up the authority of Scripture just to make somebody else feel better about themselves, you're not really loving that person in grace and truth. You're basically just saying things that will make them feel better and make perhaps the relationship you have with them feel okay. But you don't love them as much as you think. Because true God-type love gives grace and truth. Which means it's gracious, it's loving, but it also provides the guidance of God's word, which is truth. Does that make sense, everybody? Please understand, I am not untouched by this di di uh, dynamic and the, the, the situation that goes with the very issues we're going on. I have people I know that are struggling with this particular thing that our nation just legalized. But I, as a person of God who is living under the authority of the word of God, have to know how to actually be gracious to people as I connect with them in grace and what? Truth. Grace and truth. The person who loves you isn't just the one who tells you what you want to hear. The person who actually loves you is the person who tells you what you need to hear. Do you understand that? So let me give you a couple of, uh, of points. And so now what do we do? How, how do we live in light of this? Well, remember, we are the redeemed. All right, Jesus has not been stuffed back into the grave. He is still overcoming the world. The authority of the word of God is still true. The life you live underwritten by the authority of the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit is absolutely unshakable. Got it? But what do we do? Number one, I boldly live under the lordship of Christ and the authority of his word. Boldly live under the authority of the lordship of Christ and the authority of his word. So you have to make a decision, everybody. It's a choice that we make. I choose to live my life under the authority of the Word of God and the Lordship of Christ. That's how I'm going to live. All right, can I give you a couple of quick little points on what this means? Here's what this means. When you are in conversation with people and they ask you, hey, what do you think about fill in the blank? Today, this season we're in, it's all going to be about homosexual marriage, okay? It's all going to be a, a, all about that. So they're going to ask you, hey, what's your opinion about that? The, the categorical way to respond to that based on the authority of Scripture and under the Lord's Scripture and under the Lordship of Christ is, well, my opinion means very little. What the Word of God says is, you understand what I'm saying? So the, listen, everybody, this is, the, this is how you live under the, authority of Scripture, or under the authority of Scripture and the Lordship of Christ is, you know, my opinion doesn't really matter. As for me, I choose to live under the authority of Scripture and the Lordship of Christ. So this is how I'm going to conduct my life. If you're asking me what the Bible says about this issue, here's what the Bible says. Don't let them suck you in with what's your opinion. Do you understand the difference, everybody? Please, i got to move on and close the sermon. But what you have to understand is you got to choose how you're going to live. Are you going to live on the authority of Scripture under the Lordship of Christ? If so, when you're confronted with questions of your opinion on anything, you basically said, eh, my opinion doesn't really matter. God's Word says it this way. And then you speak the truth in what? Love. All right? And you're, number two, remember that the struggle is spiritual. It's not against people. The struggle is, uh, is spiritual, not against people. Let me ask you, how many of you remember when 
in, in uh, terrorist type warfare, terrorists put human shields in front of sensitive top uh, targets because they know pe the, that people in good conscience won't shoot at human shields. Y'all remember that? This is exactly what darkness does. Uses human shields to actually offset a person of good conscience willingness to actually deal with truth because they don't want to hurt a human's feelings. So we got to understand it isn't personal, it's spiritual, it's darkness at work. And that's where our weapons are. Man, we love people. We're against darkness. We don't judge people. We don't bully people. We don't do any of that stuff. And I know that right now the Bible itself is falling into the category of something called hate speech. But you have to understand how to respond in your own heart and in your own life. I don't judge people. I love people. If you're asking me how I'm living, I'm going to live my life based on the Word of God. And if, I'm, if you're asking me what do you think it says about this issue, I'll tell you that. But I'm, a, I'm not against you. Everybody understand? We are not against people of any kind. Are we against people? No. In fact, the third thing is we have to truly love people with God's love. The perfect picture of God's love is Jesus Christ when he was walking on the planet. Every time he confronted sin, he spoke the truth in love. In fact, that's what we see here. Use grace and truth. Ephesians 4.15. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. What are we saying? Moving forward, everybody, you have to choose. Base your life on the authority of the Word of God. Don't get swept into debates with your opinion. Just know and live by the Word of God. All right? Remember, people aren't the problem. Don't let the human shield affect your willingness to, number three, love people and speak the truth in love. Does that make sense, everybody? So we, I want you to understand as your pastor that we're living in the in momentous times of history. We're, we're watching a, a, a tectonic shearing in, happening in our nation, both in the culture around us and in many ways in parts of the church. But Lifelink Church is a Bible-based, Christ-centered, Spirit-filled church family. The authority of the Word of God is not for sale. Amen? Bow your heads, let me pray for you this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Today, God, we understand that we are living in extraordinary times. But God, right now, we also understand that you are the God of the Bible who sees everything. The Word says that you are the one who speaks the end from the beginning. You declare the things that are coming from the very beginning of time. You knew all of these things were coming. You, with, in, with a redemptive plan for our lives, that's good and perfect, Jeremiah 29, 11, actually knew how to fit us right into this season of your plan in time so that we could be the purveyors of grace and truth. Lord, you, Jesus, you are still victorious. Our lives are still underwritten by the authority of your grace. Jesus, the blood that you shed for us to save us from a lost and dying world is still real. The price was paid. It's still enough. But today, God, we're asking you would give us grace to be able to open our eyes so that we learn to walk wise in the world that we're in as people whose hearts are filled with your word. Uh, Psalms 119.11, so that we do not sin against you. And yet we also know how to speak the truth in love so that many will be saved. I thank you, Lord, for our church. I thank you for this assignment in Jesus' name. Right now with your eyes closed your head's bowed. I'm just saying that there are perhaps many of you right now that you know that there is, there is a decision you need to make. That you need a fresh commitment to Jesus Christ, His Lordship. That maybe you're, you're away, uh, aware that you've been kind of dulled by the love of the world around you. And you know right now you need a fresh start. Many of you perhaps in here don't know where you are with Jesus Christ. 
but in light of all this going on, you need to say, today I'm taking a firm stand. I will follow Christ with my life, with all of my life. I will not serve another God. If you don't know where you stand with Jesus, you're not sure about that, or you know you're a long way from God and need to get right with God today, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but I do want to know who I'm praying for. So right now, if you're in here, you know you need a fresh start with Jesus. Slip your hand up right now. I'm going to pray for you. Okay, good. Come on, don't be shy. Leave them up just for a second. I just want to see who I'm praying for. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, don't be shy. There are, there are more. I could feel them in my, hand, in, my, in my heart this morning. There are more. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Put your hands down. All right, I'm going to ask that you would open your mouth and say this simple prayer out loud. Mean it from the bottom of your heart, but declare it boldly with your mouth. In fact, let's all say this together. Heavenly Father, today I ask that you would make your word come alive to me in a life-changing way. Jesus Christ, thank you for dying on the cross for me to pay for my salvation. Today, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins, known or unknown, in any way against you, your word, or the Holy Spirit. Forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. Today, I turn my heart over to you and ask that you would lead me forward as my Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, you are my God, my only God. I will live faithfully for you for the rest of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit, the power that I need to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody said amen. Come on, can we just celebrate God? God is doing something good today. Thank you for watching the LifeLink Church video podcast. It's our prayer that you heard a word from God today. If you have a story to share about how God is working in your life, then let us know and send us an email at mystory at lifelinkchurch.com. 